Amen. Is it good to be found on this cold winter's morning in the house of the Lord? Amen. Can we all stand this morning and can we give the Lord a hand of praise this morning? Come on, let's clap our hands and give God all the praise. Give him all the glory. Come on, as loud as you can. He is a powerful God. Come on, as you clap, the atmosphere around you changes this morning. Welcome to Access Church this morning. It's so good to have you worship with us this morning. Can you wave at somebody next to you if you can this morning? All around you, welcome them to the house of the Lord. How many of you believe nothing is impossible with God this morning? Amen. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. Blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken, I am loving my faith, nothing is impossible. Give the 
Lord a hand of praise this morning. Come on, clap as loud as you can and praise our King this morning for there is nothing that is impossible with our God this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to be found in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Aren't we glad this morning that we have the privilege to come to church and have in-person services? We are blessed. There's so many places that still can't do that. But we have a privilege to be in God's presence. So this morning, I trust you've come expectant to receive from the Lord. Because He really wants to pour out something special into your heart this morning. So I want to encourage us this morning from Psalm 95. This is the NLT version. It says, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to Him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to Him. For the Lord is a great God. A great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. This morning, I'm reminded when I read that scripture of just the goodness of God and that he is mindful of me today and he's mindful of you today and that he is, yes, he seems sometimes that he's so far when you look above, but man, he's so near yet and he is closer than the closest friend that you can think of. And so this morning, as we just enter into a, a further time of worship, won't you just open your heart this morning and just receive what he has for you this morning and just take a time to give him thanks for all that he's done for you this morning. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Just point to somebody near you. Say, you look so handsome or so beautiful this morning. You look so blessed this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. We worship you. We give you praise, Lord. We magnify your name. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing
this morning, oh God. Let's clap our hands and give Him praise and let us worship Him. Father, we worship You this morning. We love You because You're a great and powerful God. Father, we magnify, we glorify You, for You are worthy, oh God. As we lift our hands to Him this morning, how many of you believe that you are in the right place at the right time this morning? And Father, we give you all the praise. Father, we give you all the glory. Father, we give you all the honor this morning as we lift our hands and worship our King. Lord, we thank you for another week, another day. Oh God, another moment in your presence, oh God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And this is my desire to honor you Lord with all my heart I worship you all I have I give you praise for all that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.
Presence, O oh God, there is power to be transformed. There's power to be delivered. 
there's power to be healed. And so this morning, oh God, as a people, Lord, we place our faith in you. We've come expectant to hear from heaven this morning. Fill our wells, God, with fresh living water. That when we leave this place, God, we will never be the same. Father, this morning I just pray over your people, God. You know the various needs that are here this morning. The various desires that are here this morning. And God, I want to thank you that you will meet them at the point of their need this morning. And so this morning, God, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on this morning, let's put our hands together for Jesus this morning. You may be seated in the presence of God. each and every one of you. Thank you for choosing to fellowship with us at Access Church this morning. And I count it a privilege once again to be given this opportunity to share God's word with you. And you know, it's always a, uh, such a blessing when we open up scripture and we get to learn more about God's word. And last week we began a new series called Unlikely Candidates. And we started off the series last week by defining what an unlikely candidate is. And we said that an unlikely candidate is someone who is uh, doubtful or highly improbable of being selected, of winning, being a contender, or making it in something. And we said that throughout the Bible, we actually find that God specializes in working or using unlikely people those people who society normally would have rejected, or sometimes we even, if we looked at those people, we even would not have considered them. And for those of you who may not have been here last week, uh, our key portion of scripture for the series is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 26 to 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 26 to 31. If you have your Bibles here, you could turn to that, or if you haven't uh, had a chance to bring your Bible with you, uh, the scriptures will be on the screen as we go along. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 26 to 20, uh, 31 says this. It says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of you were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, as we said last week, the way God chooses or selects people to use is not based on human norms or standards. Uh, he looks beyond, uh, beyond that. He looks uh, at things that sometimes we cannot see. You see, sometimes we look at people and we see the raw material. But when God looks at people, he sees the finished product. And as I mentioned last week, you know, if you ever know about the process of digging for gold, of discovering gold, when you dig for gold, there's a lot of dirt and mud that surrounds the gold. 
And you have to look past that in order to discover the gold. And sometimes when it comes to the lives of people, so, uh, so often we focus on the dirt and the mud that surrounds them, but we don't actually look at the gold that's on the inside of them. And so we need to pray that we would have the eyes just as, uh, uh, we would be able to see just as Jesus sees. That we will be able to see what he sees. You know, and so as I mentioned or as we discussed last week, we began by looking at our first unlikely candidate, and her name was Rahab. And we saw how Rahab was the most unlikely candidate to be included in not just one list, but two of the great lists in the Bible. And the first list that she was included in was the genealogy of Jesus, which was found in Matthew chapter 1. And the second list that we see Rahab mentioned in is what some refer to as the great hall of faith found in Hebrews chapter 11. But why was Rahab such an unlikely candidate? Because she had a bad past. Rahab, in fact, was a prostitute. And in the natural, we would think, how could God ever use a prostitute, especially to be part of his lineage? How could God use someone like that? But however, in spite of her shameful past, when God looked at her, he saw beyond her past and he saw her faith. And so Rahab's past does not end up defining her, but her faith does. And last week we were challenged to not let ourselves become a prisoner of our past, which can so often happen, where we become prisoners of our past mistakes, of the areas in which we failed and faltered. But we need to have faith in the God who holds our future. And when we begin to do that, even at times where we may have considered ourselves as unlikely candidates, when we begin to place our faith in God, God shows us that he can use us and that he has great things in store for us. Now today, as we dive into part two of our series, we're going to be looking at the second unlikely candidate. And this person is an unlikely candidate, not because of his past, but because of his very nature. You see, some of the words that we can use to describe this person we're going to be talking about uh, are the words deceitful, selfish, opportunistic, self-sufficient, self-reliant, conniving, and cunning. And I want to read Genesis chapter 25 from verse 19 to 34, where we get to find out a bit more of this character, a character that we're going to be looking at this morning. Genesis chapter 25 from verse 19 to 34. And this is what the Bible says. It says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? She went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved, loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. 
Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now the person that we're going to be speaking about this morning is not Esau, but it's a person by the name of Jacob, his twin brother. A person whose very name means deceiver. Imagine being named deceiver. But we'll find that as he goes through life, he begins to live out his name, what he's being called. And we find that as a baby, that as he comes out of his mother's womb, he's grasping or holding on to his brother Esau's heel. And we find that he becomes a person who tries everything to get ahead in life. And he uses whatever means necessary, even if it means deceiving his own family to get ahead. Such is the character or the nature of Jacob. And towards the end of the story we just read, we see how Jacob even cheats his own brother Esau into giving him his birthright, which was, his, which was Esau's rights or privileges as the older brother to inherit. And Jacob cheats his brother, or he tricks his brother into receiving what rightfully should have gone to the older son. But it doesn't just end there. Later on in Genesis chapter 27, Jacob, now with the help of his mother, Rebecca, tricks his own father, Isaac, into giving him the paternal blessing, which rightfully also belonged to Esau as, his oldest, as the oldest son. So we can see there's a lot of family conflict taking place here. There's a lot of deception. And, you know, sometimes we may look at Jacob and we may think, wow, what a bad guy. But sometimes there's a bit of Jacob in all of us. Sometimes doing things just to get ahead, being selfish and always looking out for number one, but not looking out for even those who are closest to us. And there's, there's a lot we can learn from this character of Jacob. But after this, after he both deceives his family into getting the birthright and the blessing, Jacob becomes a man on the run, trying to escape from his furious brother Esau. Now, obviously, his brother would have been furious when what had happened to him. And Esau makes a vow that he would kill his brother once his father had passed away. So Jacob runs away, he, and he ends up in the land of his mother's brother named Laban, who is equally as conniving and as selfish as Jacob is. And time after time, they try to selfishly deceive each other and Jacob ends up marrying both of Laban's daughters. One's name is Leah, and the, others is, the other one's name is Rachel. And there he starts a big family, eventually having 12 sons who would later become the 12 tribes of Israel. And they would become a mighty nation, a nation that God would begin to use. But why would God choose to use someone like Jacob with all of his flaws, with all of his faults, with all of his failures, why would God choose to use someone like Jacob to birth a nation through? You know, how would God choose just use someone like that, who was so deceitful, so selfish, so conniving, an unlikely candidate, candidate like Jacob? And to answer that question, we have to read Genesis chapter 32, from verse 22 to 31, to find out more about how could God use someone like Jacob. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and maybe in the past you've done some things, even in your own family, that were not pleasing. And you may be thinking to yourself, I'm not sure whether God would ever use me. But I want you, as we go through the story, just as God could use Jacob, to also begin to realize that God can still use you. And so, to give you a bit of background into this portion of scripture we're going to read uh, upon God's instruction Jacob uh, he finally decides to 
if we read the story, he finally decides to return to the land of his father Isaac after spending 20 years serving Laban. So he serves Laban for 20 years and then he decides uh, after God instructs him to return back to the land of his father. And on his way back, along with his family, Jacob receives word that his brother Esau was coming to meet him along with 400 men. Now, you'd have to imagine that he would have been terrified because obviously we know that Esau wanted to kill him. And so in great fear and distress, Jacob begins to pray for his life. And he begins to divide his family into two groups for safety. And he even begins to send, send gifts ahead of him to Esau to try and appease him. And so let's read what happens from verse 22 of Genesis chapter 32. It says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent across, after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until or unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. You see, Jacob gets to this place of now having a wrestling match with God himself. And if you look at Jacob's whole life, it was a life of struggle. It was a life of always fighting to get what he wanted. And now he's even fighting with God. And so let's see what happens. You see, as he begins to fight, we find that God begins to, to touch the, the socket of his hip and actually begins to injure him, begins to, to break him there. And we find that before God could use Jacob to birth the nation of Israel, he first had to have a radical encounter with God. And sometimes in our own lives, because we've always been trying to do things our own way, in order for us to be used by God, sometimes we ourselves need to have an encounter with God. We need to have a radical encounter with God, just as Jacob had. You see, the birthing of the nation, or the birthing of a nation, was preceded by the breaking of a man. And sometimes God wants to birth something on the inside of you, but first there has to be a breaking that takes place within you. You see, Israel was birthed only after Jacob was broken. I want to say that again. Israel was birthed, but only after Jacob was broken. You see, it was the same person, but the old nature had to be broken. And very often in our lives as well, the old nature, the old way of doing things has to be broken before God can start to use us for his glory. You see, from the time that Jacob was born, he had, his life was filled with struggle. It had always been a fight. And Jacob had become a self-sufficient, self-reliant man using deceitfulness and trickery to grab a hold of anything he wanted but he needed to be broken. You see, when God touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out at its socket, Jacob was broken. He became undone. He couldn't rely on his own strength any longer. All of a sudden, he moved from wrestling with God to clinging on to God. And that's what, that's what needs to happen to us as well. Very often, we are people who wrestle with God. 
but God wants us to start to cling on to him. You see, he moved from self-dependency to God-dependency. From Jacob the deceiver to Israel, a prince with God. And that's what God wants to do on the inside of each and every one of us. He wants to bring out that new nature. But it becomes when we fully surrender to him. You, you see, all along Jacob tried to do things by his own strength and ability. And there came a time where he couldn't do that any longer. He had to hold on to God. Bible teacher Charles Stanley says that brokenness is God's requirement for maximum usefulness. And I say that again. Brokenness is God's requirement for maximum usefulness. If you haven't been broken, then you're not ready yet for God to begin to use you. And some of you, I believe, know what it is to be broken. You know what it is to experience pain. But sometimes we don't know that there's a bigger purpose to our pain. That God wants to use us to birth something. That God wants to bless us. You see, before God can bless you, sometimes he first has to break you. And one of the greatest blessings in life is the birthing of something. One of the greatest blessings in life is the birthing of something. You see, a mother's water has to, be, has to break before a baby is born. An eggshell has to be broken in order for a chick to hatch. A seed has to crack and break in order for it to grow. There's always breaking before birthing. There's always breaking before blessing. So if you're going to, through a breaking process, just bear in mind that there's a blessing and a birthing that is coming. You see, God spe specializes in using that which is broken. God's not, not looking for perfect people, but God's looking for broken people who know they don't have it all together so that he can get the glory when he starts to use them. And this morning, I want to give you three examples of how God uses broken things for his glory. And the first example I want to give you is found in Judges chapter 7 from verse 16 to 21. Judges chapter 7 from verse 16 to 21. And this is the story of how Gideon and his army of 300 men were able to defeat the Midianites. And I want you to take notice of how they did this without any weapons. It says, dividing the 300 men in three into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow out trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, just as they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. The Midianites ran away without any weapons or ammunition being used by Gideon and his army. It was broken jars that helped Gideon and his army defeat the Midianites. And sometimes that, that's all God needs, broken jars. The second example is found in Matthew chapter 14 from verse 13 to 21. Matthew 14 from verse 13 to 21. And it says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had, co he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to their villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. 
We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they, they answered. Bring them here, he said to me. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. You see, it was broken pieces of bread in the hands of God that fed the multitudes. And you may be looking at yourself this morning as a broken person, but in the hand of God, little can become much. The third example I want to use is found in Mark chapter 14, verse 3. And it says, While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. You see, even the alabaster jar had to be broken in order for Jesus' body to be anointed. You see, many things that God uses for his glory first has to be broken. And in a similar way, if you've been through a breaking process, get ready for God to start to use you. Psalm 51 from verse 16 to 17 says this, You do not desire sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. You see, God wants to work with broken people. God wants to work with people who admit that they don't have it all together. God's not looking for per perfect people. Sometimes he's looking for people who would just come to him broken and repentant. So how do we know that Jacob's nature really changed? You see, when Jacob left the presence of God, he left with a limp, a sign that he had been broken. But what is the fruit that there was really a change in his nature? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 35 from verse 1 to 4. Genesis 35 from verse 1 to 4. This is what the Bible says. It says, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel, Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. You see, God had broken him, and now he was even able to bury those things which sometimes he would have been fighting for. You see, he was able to build an altar to God because God was now Lord of his life. And just as Jacob buried those foreign gods and those foreign idols, even in our own lives, when God begins to break us, there are certain things in our lives, certain idols that we now need to bury as well. What are those things that you've been holding on that need to be buried even from today? The second sign that Jacob's character or nature was changed is found in Genesis chapter 47 from verse 7 to 10. It says, Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult and they do not equal the years of pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. You see, the guy who always 
fought for the blessing was now able to bless someone else. And that is how we know that his nature had changed. You see, before we come to Christ, we are very selfish. But God is able to change our nature so we can become selfless, selfless and being able to help other people. The guy who sought the blessing now blesses others. You see, Jacob was always holding on to the wrong thing. He held on to everything except God. And sometimes that's what happens in our own lives. And some of you this morning may have been chasing after the wrong thing. But once you grab a hold of God, you'll never need anything else. Once you grab a hold of God. But something has to break. Something has to break. And so this morning, even as I would just pray with you this morning, I wonder if we could stand as we come to a conclusion of this sermon. Jacob, the most unlikely candidate for God to use to birth a nation. He was a deceiver. He was selfish. He was conniving. He tricked his own family. Yet because he came to this place of brokenness, God had to break him. God was able to use him to birth a mighty nation through. And for, for some of you, maybe you've been wrestling God for a long time. And my challenge to you today is stop wrestling with God. Allow God to do what he needs to do in your life. If there's a breaking that needs to be, take place, allow that to take place. Stop wrestling God. Begin to grab a hold of him. Stop relying on yourself. Start to rely on him. Because everything you need can be found in him. And so even as we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning, maybe you've come here this morning and maybe for a while you've considered yourself an unlikely candidate because you know for yourself your very nature. That sometimes you do things that are very displeasing to God. Maybe in your own family you've done things that were not pleasing to God. But this morning I want to just pray over you that you'd allow God to, to break you and it will be a painful process. But that at the end of every breaking there's always a birthing and there's always a blessing. And maybe you're here this morning and you've been through a breaking process. I want to reassure you that God has something great at the end in store for you. I just want to pray over you this morning. And whatever you need at this time, I just want you to cry out to God. Father, we come to you today in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. And Father, even today, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for relying on our own strength to get ahead. Forgive us, Lord, for doing things that were not, dis not pleasing to you, Lord. But today, Lord, we, we open ourselves to you. Lord, we declare that we will no longer wrestle you, Lord, but we'll hold on to you, Lord Jesus. For those of us who have been broken, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that the, at the end of this breaking, Lord, there's a great birthing, but there's a great blessing in store for us, Lord. And Lord, where we've thought of ourselves as unlikely to be used by God, I thank you, Lord, that now we know that we are the perfect candidates to be used for your glory, Lord. So I pray for every brother and every sister that has come this morning, Lord. I pray, Lord, for a deep work that you will continue to do and that, Holy Spirit, you will begin to be the after speaker even into this message that I've shared this morning, Lord, that you'll begin to just speak to your hearts of the hearts of your people, even this week, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, even if you, as you've listened to me share, maybe you've, you'd like to just remember, uh, you'd like for us to remember you in prayer throughout this week. There's a connection card that's in front of your seat and you're welcome to fill out a prayer request there and we'd love to pray for you. Whatever need it may be, we have intercessors who just love to pray for you during the week or if you just want to 
just make contact with us fill in that card as well and as we prepare to take up the tithes and the offering you can also drop off that card in the offering basket we're just going to get ready to receive of our tithes and our offering if you are visiting with us for the first time you're not obligated or obliged to give but if you would love to give this morning if you feel part of this family and you'd love to give we believe in the principle of sowing and reaping we believe that we should not be manipulated to give but we should give joyfully cheerfully and willingly as well and so even as stanton would lead us in a chorus i welcome you to come and give at this time god bless you all my life you have been So, so good Every breath that I am grateful I will sing the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been in prayer just a reminder that our discovery track for those of you who are interested in being part of this family our discovery track starts this afternoon from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here and so if you still want to register you can see Lorraine or Melissa at the information desk and um, before you go or after we just close in prayer we'd love to bless you with a cup of coffee or tea and so you're welcome to just uh, stay for some co- a cup of coffee or tea afterwards as well you know one of the things i just want to leave you with before i close in prayers for some of you i feel you've been fighting god but there comes a point where you have to give in to the purposes and the plans of god so don't fight any longer just give in to what god wants to do in your life can we just close in prayer father we just thank you for this time where we can ha- could have had in your presence lord I thank you Lord for everything that has said and be, uh, that has been said and done Lord. And so Father even as we go right now Lord first I'd like to thank you for uh, every person that has given this morning Lord. I pray a blessing upon them Lord. I pray Lord that you'd multiply the seed that they have sown not just 30 not just 60 but a hundredfold as well Lord. May they not lack anything Lord. May their cupboards never run dry Lord. And even as we go right now Lord we pray for safe travel, we pray for your protection. We pray Lord may we have an awesome week Lord. May we have just a week of favor and we pray Lord that you would protect us and that you'd cover us uh, just under your blood as well Lord. Have your angels in camp around us. wherever we go lord so we thank you lord and we give you praise for just your presence in this place this morning and now may the love of god the grace of our lord jesus christ and the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all until we meet again in jesus name god
God bless you. We'll see you next week. And please join us next week Sunday for part three of our Unlikely Candidate series. <laughs>